Hello, everyone. Sorry. Interesting. Okay. I'm going to do that video next. This is a, kind of a new channel I've done before. It's called Fright Factor. Um, and this is distressing and not safe for work things from the internet volume three. I think I did volume seven. It was the first one I saw. Uh, volume one is up there clearly. Um, but it was seven minutes. So I haven't not done that one. It's a little short. It might be one that I'll tag on with another video just as a random whatever. Um, but if you, uh, can click that thumbs up button for me, that helps tremendously. You can subscribe to the channel if you'd like. Sorry. What is going on now? Okay, sorry about that. Um, bunch of camera thing was going off. Just picking up traffic. Okay, what was I saying? If you click that thumbs up button, that helps me out. You can subscribe to the channel. You can donate to the channel through the thanks button. And if you do, you can request a video your name gets sponsoring for that video you can still request without donating it just takes a little time and you don't get that added little bonus so i'm going to shut up now let's get into the video this is a photo from 9 11 that i'm not allowed to show you on youtube it pertains to a story that very few people talk about and many believe it's the only known photo of the infamous black tag lady the Black Tag Lady, or the Lady in the Plaza, is a gut-wrenching story told by one of the first responders that were present at Ground Zero on 9-11. It tells the story of a Jane Doe who had experienced horrific bodily trauma but was still somehow conscious and speaking to him after falling from one of the towers. The story was later uploaded online and was told from the perspective of Ernest Armstead, an emergency medical specialist who was present at the Twin Towers at the time of the attack. I'm going to go ahead and read it to you guys before we discuss more. It's quite long, so I trimmed down a few paragraphs and put the full story in the description. And as usual, listen at your own risk, because this one's sad. This lady was among a half dozen people I saw who probably fell a thousand or so feet when American Airlines Flight 11 crashed into the World Trade Center. I'm not sure how she got in the plaza. Maybe she was on her way to Los Angeles and was ejected from the jet by force of the collision. Or maybe she was an office worker in the tower sitting near one of the windows and she was swept away when the building caved around her. Or maybe she was trapped and jumped to escape the flames, though I don't think so. I happened upon her even before most of those people were seen jumping. She was an elegant lady about my age, early 50s. I could see that even with all that she had been through. I could tell that she had her hair out very nicely, brunette. She had on tasteful earrings, she was wearing pretty makeup, and in my profession you notice clothes because so often you have to cut them into pieces to save lives. That was the first thing that came to mind. This lady is well dressed. When the plane hit, an incredible amount of debris from the collision rained down on the plaza. Most of it was chunks of airplane and building that had little meaning to me, but amid the destruction there were a half dozen or so people. I ran toward them with my triage tags in hand. There was a man having a seizure and his eyes were rolling into the back of his head. He had struck the pavement so hard that there was virtually nothing else left of him. There were a couple others that I never got to, but I could see from a short distance that they were dead. And then there was a lady with the nice hairdo and earrings. Triage is the first thing that should be done in a disaster like this. Basically means dividing the injured into four categories so that backup medical teams can move quickly in and give treatment to those who need it most urgently. The categories are indicated by colored tags that are hung around the injured person's neck. Green is the least serious. Yellow more so. Red indicates critical injuries, and black means a person is dead or close to it. When you're engaged in a triage, you have one thing in the back of your mind all the time. My backup is coming, my backup is coming. That's the reason you could tag people who obviously need help and not stop and give it to them right then. When I got to her, I ripped out a black tag. What impressed me and scared me was that she was alert and was watching what I was doing. I put the tag around her neck and she looked at me and said, I'm not dead. Call my daughter. I'm not dead. I was so startled that for a split second I was speechless. Ma'am, I said, don't worry about it. We will be right back to you. That was a lie. She couldn't see what I could see. Somehow I guess it was an air draft or something. Her fall had been cushioned enough so that she didn't splatter like the others. Still her body was so twisted and torn apart that I could only ask myself, why is this lady still alive and talking to me? How can this be? Her right long shoulder and head were intact, but from the diaphragm down she was unrecognizable. Yet she was lucid enough that she continued to argue with me. I'm not dead, she insisted again. 
I'm convinced that she had some sort of medical training because she knew I had given her the black mark of death, and she resented it. Don't worry what I put around your neck, I told her. My coworkers are coming right now, and they're going to take care of you. I knew I had to keep going, but she had so deeply shaken me that I lingered for a second or two. Then I stepped over her to get to the others. I put a black tag on the man having the seizure, but another wave of casualties arrived in the lobby from upstairs, so I needed to return. As I headed back, I stepped over the lady one more time, and as eerie and unsettling as our first encounter had been, the second was even worse. She started yelling at me. I'm not dead. They're coming, I replied without stopping, where she yelled again, I'm not dead, I'm not dead. I went back to the lobby, putting her out of my mind for now. There was so much that needed to be done. I began tagging the hundreds of people coming out of the building. I can honestly say that I didn't fear death, though I walked for hours in a wretched place I can only describe with a biblical reference. The valley of the shadow of death. I felt death, I heard it, I saw it, and I smelled it. And with that lady in the plaza, I even talked to it. I've read a lot of disturbing shit over- I've never heard about this lady with the black tag before. Granted, I don't look into a lot of 9-11 things just because it's... I don't know. It's still new. I don't know. Hold on. Sorry. I got a little puppy. And um, he's all over the place. And uh, I, I just thought he disappeared under something. And he was right under my, my seat. All right. For the years, and I'm not even lying when I say this is one of the most terrifying things I've ever read. To imagine the complete shock of seeing what looks like a deceased person coherently talking to you is straight out of a horror movie. And just to clarify, this is not some fictional storyteller or a creepypasta dude. Ernest Armstead is a confirmed survivor of the September 11th attacks and had far more media coverage on him beyond just this one story. Many accredited people do however point out that some of the things he said are impossible, but I see them as just misconceptions. It's obviously physically impossible to survive a fall from that height landing in a concrete plaza, but what's more likely to me is that she was struck by falling debris and lived for a short period thereafter. Individuals across the internet claim to think they've found her body in photos after tracing the location and time Ernest cited, like this post right here. Others believe the story was a result of his brain making up for the trauma, and some people believe he's not telling the truth at all. I personally think he's telling the complete truth and misremembering something along the way. I don't see the net gain in lying when he was clearly a part of this, had a ton of coverage and experiences, and stands to gain nothing through this. I hope he has since been doing better, but some things never leave your mind. This goes way too deep to cover in one entry, so let me know if you'd like me to cover it in full. This is a short entry, but it's a particularly dark one as it pertains to American slavery and the years of mistreatment towards African Americans in the country. It's actually a relatively well-known book, but it has a website that goes with it, and I think they do equally well at getting a message across as they expose a lesser-known side of how Americans at the time viewed this, and they do so in an unfiltered manner. WithoutSanctuary.org is a website containing a collection of photos that depict African-American lynchings throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, some of them being as recent as the 1960s. It gives names and details about their lives if it's available and seeks to show how even after death these individuals never received any sanctuary. It gets this point across well because the photos you see aren't just ordinary photos. They're postcards and prints that people would take with them after witnessing public hangings and hold on to as if they were some sort of souvenir, showing once again that even after death these poor people were without sanctuary. And this isn't just a few postcards, there's a countless number of them that you can span through on this site. They're very graphic and heartbreaking, but sometimes seeing the raw nature of these historical atrocities will help people to better understand just how serious it really was. In addition to the photo section, the website has an overview section that addresses the author's goals with the project as well as a link to purchase the book and an age-restricted YouTube video with 200,000 plus views. I felt like including this entry because it has a really potent message to it and the postcard thing is just mind-boggling to me.
On the 15th of August 2009, 14-year-old Kevin Barrera was shot and killed beside a railroad track in Richmond, California. His father cited that he was in a complete haze and was doing everything he could to block it out in the days following because it just did not make sense. Kevin was known as a genuine, awesome kid with many interests, citing that he would skateboard one week and play with electronics the next. The murder was just over 15 years ago and, to this day, the case still seems to be unsolved and without any answers. If you try to search anything regarding this case in recent years, nothing comes up with the most recent being in 2013 or 2014. So I can only surmise that, unfortunately, this tragic case still remains unsolved. Not only did this poor family have to deal with the loss of their beloved teenage son, but an awful twist would come in the years following, making the situation that much more grim. In fact, this case seems to be more well known for what I'm about to show you than the murder itself. In early 2012, people would end up noticing what looked like a lifeless body on Google Street View near a set of train tracks and posting it to a website called Google Sightseeing. It was eventually pieced together that this was poor Kevin, I'll be- I've heard about this story. I've heard about this. ...it much later. After a certain amount of time, it got around to Kevin's parents, which just tormented them even more. Kevin's father stated, when I see this image, that's still like that happened yesterday. And that brings me back to a lot of memories. When the press got a hold of this terrible story and the situation became more well known, Google was alerted and publicly apologized, claiming they would remove the image. Google has never accelerated the replacement of updated satellite imagery from our maps before, but given the circumstances, we wanted to make an exception in this case, Google Maps Vice President Brian McClendon said in a statement to KPIX5. It took a few years longer than it ever should have to be removed, but sadly, situations like this are bound to happen when the Earth's entire surface is being documented thousands of times over. Just makes it so much worse that it's a 14 year old kid. Anyways, I really hope this family can find peace. Kevin seemed like a great kid and no 14 year old deserves to have something like that happen, let alone have his deceased body posted for everyone to see. That's gonna do it for this video guys. Thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it. If you liked it at all, just please- Kinda felt like a fast 10 minutes. Hmm. Yeah, I heard about that last one. That's got to be gut-wrenching. Without Sanctuary. Never heard of that, but... I don't know why you'd want a book on it. Yeah, I don't, I've never heard of the Black Tag Lady. So these two were new. I had heard of poor kid. All right. Well, I'm going to end this here. I uh, hope you enjoyed the reaction. And until next time, have a good day. Have a good night.